Today you guys are going to get an insight on how I put together my storyboards and comic slash manga layouts based on my scripts. For the tutorial we're going to be using actual Apple Black scripts basically from the new additional pages that were added to Apple Black Volume 2's remasters. So this is a little nice behind the scenes for all of you who have copped the books and enjoyed especially the new remasters you'll be able to see how I put all of that together. First things first, let's get definitions out of the way, at least for this video. So first we have the storyboards, the storyboards to me, for comics specifically. As easily as I can explain them, are essentially like blueprints of how the panels are going to be stacked against one another on a page and how the pages are going to be placed side by side. You want to know what page is on the left and what page is on the right. It's all part of the planning. You kind of want to know everything you're going to do before you then have like a finalized version in ink. Once it's in ink, it's harder to edit, it's harder to change, fix, and all of that. You want to make sure you've done all of the thinking, any ideas have been thoroughly thought out in that storyboarding phase. After the storyboarding phase, the way you can do that can be in little thumbnails on a sketchbook, or it's kind of up to you how you want to do it, but this is how I do it. In some cases, they're actually often referred to as names. Anybody who's watched Bakuman or read it knows what I'm talking about. It could be directly on a separate layer if you're working digitally, and then the next step would be a penciled, more defined, less sketchy draft, and then you go into inking, and then you know, list goes on, toning or coloring, all depends on what route you're taking to execute your pages from start to finish. It's always good to know and good practice to know what page ends up where, if it's gonna be on the left or it's gonna be on the right. That way, based on the reading orientation, you can plan a cool twist or reveal after they flip a page. So you're building tension in that spread. If the reading orientation is from left to right, you're building tension from the left page to the right page to make them want to flip the page for the reveal. You can't always overuse that trick, but there are several ways of doing it and you just kind of have to find a way that works for you and it's something that you can justify. I've seen comics where the panels kind of get smaller to make things tense as you keep on reading from the left page to the right page and then once you flip the page, the new panel on the left, on the new left, is this huge big page revealing something, whether it's a twist or some kind of cliffhanger or whatever the case may be, and that just keeps the reader engaged and keeps them where you want them. You're doing this with the script, the dialogue, all of that, and with the visuals using the storyboards. Now, if you can do it without the dialogue, in some cases it can actually be better, but you can use both. During the storyboarding phase, you're also thinking about where the text bubbles are going to be placed, how the panels are going to be shaped. If you want it to be simple, let's say the scene is really calm, you might want the panels to be very organized. But if it's like a chaotic scene, you might want to have it popping out of its original place. You might have it bleeding all the way to the edge of the paper. And I'll kind of elaborate on that as we go forward. How the actual drawings are going to be shown. What are the storytelling techniques that you're going to utilize within the panels? What camera angles are you going to use? Why are you using those camera angles? angles like what are you showing you don't want every panel to just be a headshot 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 you want to show other things show background why are you showing that background you're showing the background from a certain angle why are you showing the background from a certain angle so you're you're showing characters you're thinking about the camera angles you're showing them from you're thinking about the body parts you're showing and why you're showing that you are thinking about the panels that you have strategically planned to let them have backgrounds and for some to not have backgrounds and depending on your style maybe all of them should have backgrounds and maybe only a few of them should have just enough backgrounds within the scene so that the reader knows exactly where the scene is taking place or maybe your original idea is to draw backgrounds in every panel but you've organized things in such a way that you know the important backgrounds to draw before others in case of time. Maybe your style requires that some backgrounds aren't necessarily gonna be physical backgrounds with their room and a chair and a whatever, and maybe they'd be abstract because they're symbolic as to something else, referencing something else, or maybe they're an Easter egg. All of this is you figuring this out within the blueprint of the comic, which is the storyboard. Maybe sometimes you're building tension or you, you wanna surprise them with that page flip and you're flipping to a double spread where a panel goes across one page to the other, depending on how big or impactful that reveal is. 
how you cut the panels diagonally, all of that you figure out in this phase. Now, the way I do it with my comics is I derive my storyboard based off of the scripts, which leads to our next definition, which is my scripts. Now, people have their own ways of putting this together. You can actually go the more industry standard or formal way of putting this together and use the format used for, you know, Hollywood screenplays or whatever you want to do. Also, in my case, as a one man army, it doesn't matter where I write the script. I'm just using Microsoft Word. It's very simple here, but again, you can go a more traditional path, how you can write it in a Hollywood format with all the software that are out there. But as long as you know what you're writing, you're fine. If you're working in a team, you guys kind of discuss on what format you want, you do that. All of that is kind of up to you or up to whoever is in charge. Maybe if you're in a team, you want something that everybody can have easy access to and everybody can read it. But in my case, where I'm a one man army, I don't really care about that. So my scripts for the sake of this video is primarily just narration and dialogue slash monologue. Now tips for dialogue, tips for monologue and all of that, that's a separate video. Writing scripts, the actual techniques and putting that together, that's a separate video. This is kind of like real quick understanding of what my scripts are, at least for me, and how I take that and form a storyboard. I write the scripts and based off of that, just reading it sometimes, I can visualize some of the scenes, even if I'm visualizing it in, whether it's manga or you know anime form, I can kind of see some things just based off the keywords that I've used in the script, I can kind of tell, okay, this is the camera angle that would be best for this scene based off of what's going on, based off of what's being said, based off of what's being focused on within that scene. Obviously that comes with practice and also comes with you studying other forms of media within film, music videos, other anime, manga, the list goes on. You're not just watching those or consuming those just as a consumer, but you're also studying them and trying to put yourself in the shoes of the creator or director or whatever, or cinematographer and all of that to understand why they're making the decisions you're making. Because when you look at film and cinematography and all of that, there is that uniform language that ties in everything together. At the end of the day, you're making decisions that you can justify and they're based off of maybe storytelling techniques that you've picked up here and there. Usually when you see a character in front of a cracked mirror, that usually means X, Y, Z. Or maybe you want a panel where the character is not shown directly. Maybe they're shown through a reflection off of like a puddle of water on the floor or a mirror, the list goes on. Those kind of mean certain things. And so you kind of have to be thinking on, on that level to make the decisions that you're making. And not everything needs to be overthought out. Some things can be very simplified and very clear as to why you've chosen maybe that camera angle or that dialogue or whatever. It doesn't always have to be too complicated. It all depends on, you guessed it, your style. And rest assured, I will make a video in the future that will focus on the best visual storytelling techniques to use, tips, tricks, all of that. Subscribe. Sometimes I form the script, the dialogue, monologue. I take a step back, I come back, I review it, I edit, tweak a couple things here and there, and then I split it up into pages, right? I look at the script and I figure out, you know what, this would be a good place to end a page, or this would be a good place to end a spread, right? So I'm thinking about the script in a way where it's broken down into a left page and a right page. So I'm thinking if the reading orientation is left to right, where is the best place to, to do a page flip? So I have the script split into sections of two page spreads each. That way I'm just working on each two page spread section. Now in some cases you can actually split your script page by page if you want everything fixed down to that detail, but that's up to you. And make sure where the split happens, where that page flip happens. It happens at a point where I know I can build tension to, to make them want to flip the page. I'm also making sure that the events taking place are enough for two pages. The good thing about this trick is if you have a page limit, let's say you have a page limit for the whole comic or the whole chapter or whatever, once you have that in the back of your mind, once you write down that story and you know what the page limit is, it allows you to be creative and cut out things that maybe you don't need. And you can do that in the storyboard phase as well. And it also drives for more creativity for you to find creative ways to make certain things fit in a page or fit in a spread. Sometimes I think of an event and I go, you know what, you know what, this shouldn't pass six pages. And if it does, maybe I'm dragging on. I wanna get my point across effectively and quickly in an efficient manner. You don't wanna drag on, right? So sometimes this allows you to be creative and look at the whole comic before it's in its final stage and see where maybe you're going too slow or where it could be boring, right? The blueprint allows you to see the comic before the comic is actually complete and make those changes easily. 
there are times I'll have a certain set of events that I want to fit into two pages, but maybe I'm feeling like it needs an extra page. There's some times where I'm right and it does need an extra page. And so I kind of reframe things and dissect the script in a different way. Or sometimes I can find like a creative way to actually make it fit two pages because maybe there was a part of it that I felt, you know what, I can cut that out. So I go page one and then I go page three and then five kind of split in that order because I want to know where the flip is. So when I'm doing the storyboard, I know what's within a left page and a right page on just one section and I just work from there. Now sometimes, even though I structure it that way, when I start storyboarding, I can change my mind because maybe I get a better idea based off of the couple sketches and concept art and the little storyboarding that I've done that will then make me go back to my script and tweak it to fit the storyboard. And the same way we're constructing the storyboards off of the script, the storyboards can also turn around and influence the script itself. And then you just keep going back and forth until you have what you want. There are many moments where I've changed dialogue or I've changed a whole complete fight scene just based off of an idea that I got while storyboarding. So there isn't one way to do it. Be fluid, be open to improvement, be open to new ideas or even suggestions if you have an editor. Because usually if you have an editor, whether it's just an editor for a text or an editor for the whole shebang, text, art, all of it, from your publisher or whatever, they probably have experience with this and you know they can probably give suggestions and they can kind of guide you in the right direction. But in cases where you don't have an editor, you're doing this all of your, on your own, you just kind of have to be your own editor at that point. The main thing here is to kind of keep an open mind while putting this all together and be thinking thoroughly for the best approach to convey your story. I recommend finding other media, it doesn't matter what it is, film, other comics, the list goes on. Maybe you can find the script version and then go look at the movies and try to visualize or put yourself in the shoes of the creator and try to figure out why they made the decisions that they made. Or you're just looking at other media and trying to construct and deconstruct what was going on and study all of that. It's up to you how detailed you want to be, especially in film. Usually you can see a little Easter eggs here and there that are tiny and you, you find stuff like that less so in comics, but you can also put that amount of detail into your comics. But first, we'll go over how I format the pages and how I put everything together, how I start to do that. Especially if you're creating stuff for print, most printers have a certain format or guideline that they go by for your work to actually be printed properly. I've already set the pages up side by side how I want them to be in my storyboard. I kind of put that together. I know where the page is going to start. If the page of the chapter starts on the left side of a book or the right side of a book, or maybe there's an empty page before the chapter starts or whatever, you want to figure everything out. So here I have the pages placed exactly where I know they're going to be. And then in some cases I join the pages together if I know that's going to be a double spread knowing that I'll separate them later. Separated, each page needs to go through the same formatting as a regular single page, and we'll kind of go through the formatting as the video goes on. I set them up how I would imagine them to be when you open up a book. The basic things to know are where the pages meet in the middle, that's called the gutter, and then there is an imaginary borderline on each page where the center is called the live area, and that's where you want to have important art and text, especially the text, because any art or text outside of that is not centered and the closer it is to the edge of the paper or the gutter, the higher the risk it gets of being cut during the printing stage. So it's always good practice to always keep important art and text within the live area. And then you are kind of creating your panels also within that live area as a guideline. Now sometimes you can have the panel extend to bleed to the edge of the paper or even to the gutter. But you still have to make sure the text is within the live area and the art, especially art that has to be seen for the story to make sense, you want to keep it as far away from the edge as possible. Now some of these lines and where they're placed may vary from printer to printer or based on different page sizes. So here's an example of a page and this is a double spread and we can see these things that are color coded. And if you can't tell here, the white place is just a live area and this is the page on the left and this is the page on the right. Then you have the yellow as the margins, the red is like the trim area and this is where the cut of the paper will actually happen. So you definitely don't want any important art or text to be this close to the edge of the paper. And then the blue just lets us know where the gutter is and then you see a darker line to really sell that that's where the cut in between both pages happen. And this is a page that kind of passes because all the text is within the live area. 
all the important art that I want you to see is within the live area. You can go look at this panel over here, see all the text safely away from the edge of the paper, which is what you want to do. There is art that I might want you to see, but again, the more important art is further away from the edge. And definitely stuff in the red, I'm okay with that getting cut. Sometimes sound effects don't matter as much, so you can get away with that. But definitely text that you have to read, that's a no-no for industry standard. You wanna make sure it's clearly centered, it's clearly legible, clearly readable, because what's the point of all the pictures if you can't read the actual words? And so it kind of passes all of that. Here, you can see it doesn't pass completely here because we have like some sound effect. But remember, like I said, for things that are just sound effects, you can get away with that. It depends on how lax your printer is or the format, your publisher, all that. The rules aren't the same completely. Even the margins that have been set here, this is for a specific printer. It might be different for its different publishers and you know, the list goes on. Here you can then look at the pages separately. Same thing's going on for the left page and then the right page. Here's another page. It's just the text that needs to be within the live area. So for instance, if this, if this page was kind of like here where part of the text bubble is in the yellow and the margins, it's still fine because the actual text is safely in the live area. Now here's how I play with those rules without necessarily breaking them. Especially if you want to do things in a way that is similar to popular shonen manga out there, like a One Punch Man or My Hero Academia. Obviously it's not going to be the same, but close to that format. Just know that whatever format you choose, you want to be consistent with your rules on each page. Now the standard layout usually starts with the live area and then you can extend the panels to bleed to the edge. That's a very common theme within Shonen Manga. It's best to stretch it out completely. Don't stretch it halfway. If you're gonna stretch it out completely, stretch it out completely. If you're not gonna stretch it, you wanna make sure that the lines are in line with that initial imaginary borderline. Again, it depends on your style. Here, we're trying to do something similar to popular Shonen Manga. There are cases where you can extend the panel halfway and not necessarily fully, but this is how I do things. So it's best to stretch completely, but you still have art be shown from important to less important as it extends to the edge of the page. So the text will always be within the live area no matter what. And then I rarely have a case where the word balloon is layered above the panel lines. They're always within the panels where you can always clearly see the separation from panel to panel. There are rare occasions where I break that rule especially when a character is continuing a dialogue from one panel to another. In some cases you can have the word balloon be layered above the panel lines between the two panels, kind of connecting those panels. I'll go into more details as to where you can break those rules here and there in a future video. Here, we just wanna go over the basics. Starting off, I wanted to do something flashy. I wanted you to like flip the page and see this panel that goes from the left to the right easily and just looks cool because sometimes you want your page layouts to be interesting, in some cases unique, but maybe in some cases convey some kind of hidden message or clear message, but you want to make sure the story is being told correctly, the pacing is right, nothing feels rushed, and for things like that, you can always kind of get feedback from credible sources if necessary. Not always necessary, but in some cases, if you feel like it would help you, then you can do so. Here you can see me trying to figure out where the live area is gonna be and how it's gonna be read, and I don't want the reading orientation to be confusing. So sometimes when you're putting together the layout, you wanna make sure that the way you've placed the panels, the way you've placed the text bubbles, they are easy to read and not confusing. You don't want your audience trying to figure out what text balloon to read first. You don't want them trying to figure out what panel to read first because that can pull them out of the immersion of reading the comic. So here I've decided to go with something a little more easy to follow. And you have this gigantic panel that goes across from the first page to the second page. And now I'm plotting out how I want it to look. I, I want it to have like some buildings and I want the audience to kind of be looking up at all the chaos that's gonna be going on and be looking at all these buildings towering all of them and all these monsters kind of destroying uh, the city here i'm also trying to figure out what i want to do with that first panel like how do we how do i introduce the scene and because this is the this is like a completely new scene we're flipping the page to a new scene and so i'm trying to figure out how to introduce all this chaos and so maybe i want like buildings on the side right there 
and then we have this beam coming from one of the marionettes kind of gliding through all these buildings so i'm going to have to draw all that chaos i'm going to figure out how all of that's going to look i'm not too focused on the details right here during the storyboarding phase but i just want to make sure i've thought about everything thoroughly and the world the text bubbles are going to be i know what i'm looking at in some cases other people might not be able to decipher what i'm drawing over here but it's just for my eyes so i'm not too worried about that i'm figuring out whether i want speed lines sound effects stuff like that where they're going to be placed to kind of let the viewer kind of visualize how the camera is moving here figuring out where everything's going to be text balloon sound some sound effects where some figures characters are going to be placed all the damage is going to be and just kind of going from there you're putting the other panel i'm giving it these slanted looks you know because it's it just feels more chaotic that way versus having the panels be cut 90 degrees and since the line above it is cut going from left to right as it's slanted down i decided to do the opposite with the panels at the bottom i want something where we kind of see this character come into play and we start with our hands you never want to have all your panels be faces 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 you always want to break things down a little bit because if you just have a bunch of headshots every two seconds then it kind of comes off cheap boring you know so switch it up when you can in interesting ways that still pushes the story forward gives it not some nice pacing so here i'm having her hands kind of rise up as she's about to use her wand i'm going to have that tone and i'm not going to draw backgrounds in there so we're just going to be focusing on her hand and then it's almost like the camera kind of pans to the left to see her head i'm not even showing her full head i'm not going to show like most of the nose and the eyes and all of that it'll just be her lips as she's casting this spell using her wand fabrica which is kind of like a fabric based wand and wands are essentially you know the tools or weapons used by sorcerers in my comic i have several videos on wands and i'll link to a separate video if you want to learn more about wands so here i've put those two panels there i have them kind of stacked on top one another usually the smaller the panel the easier it is for a reader to just glide through them right bigger panels readers tend to tend to want to spend more time with those versus smaller panels it's easier to just know that maybe the cuts are quick imagine if it was an actual film form you can think that the camera is just making like quick cuts and it's just going from shot to shot to shot so that's why those panels are smaller at least that's my reasoning for it you kind of want to figure out yours now here the next panel again is going to do something a little different where we now see the full characters almost like she's being introduced for the first time here i'm going to have her hands doing some fancy stuff as the ones are going to be attacking the marionettes that are wreaking havoc and i'm going to have her pop out of the panel just a little bit to have things be more interesting especially to give the reader a good view of the character again speed lines all of that then the next panel is another panel that kind of extends from the left page to the right page and that's just me pulling the camera back showing her use her fabric based wand fabrica to kind of wrap two marionettes together in some cases you see me leaving notes on the side you know in case maybe i don't want to draw something but i want to remind myself of stuff so dust particles all of that here i wanted to add more depth to the top panel maybe have all the characters uh, at the bottom looking up at these monsters maybe show some more depth where some of the characters are closer to us and all this is based on the script again how i cut the panels how i make that slant i usually try not to have the slants be the same slant it's almost like i switch between slants that's for simplified things and maybe the last panel over there kind of extends to the bottom here we're doing things more chaotic so i don't have things looking that simple and even though i pulled that to the bottom you can also pull it to the bottom and to the left or or the right depending on what side of the book it's going to be you just want to pull it away from the gutter usually the only time you go into the gutter is mostly if you want to do a double spread kind of like what we're doing right here or you know you want to do something special or different at the end of the day you're just seeing me making decisions that i know i can justify later so here i'm having a clear shot of just the monsters wrapped with her wand once hitting the floor i'm also still open to change and that's just really the mindset that you kind of have to have going into making pages like this uh, the speed lines that's based off of how i envision the camera moving right so when you see a scene you know, whether it's film real life or an animation whatever it is if the camera moves quickly what's going to be blurry 
that's where the speed lines are going to be and in what direction is it going to be blurry that's you know the angle that the speed lines are going to be in it's a little more complicated than that and then maybe in the future i'll have a video on speed lines specifically i have one in the past but i think i can make an updated and better one i remember that double spread was really two pages and when i have five to six as you can see in the script that's a double spread so it's just five to six so here i have only seven but really in my head i know that's seven and eight right I just wanted to know where the cut is or where the page flip would happen. So this is me kind of deciding how I want the pages to be split. Can I have a decent idea already just from reading the script? She has two of the marionettes kind of subdued. And so I have her at the bottom kind of saying something as she's getting some assistance or help from another character that will kind of fly from behind her. So I have this guy kind of flying behind her. They're kind of doing a little tag team here, putting some dust on the floor as the marionettes kind of dropped because it's been pulled down by Fulani's wand, Fabrica. And then he's gonna jump on it and he's touched. It's kind of like Gambit from X-Men. He touches it and it kind of implodes. And then she's gonna pull the other one to collide with the marionette exploding kind of have both of them collide, killing two birds with one stone. And I'm just figuring out how everything's going to be positioned. You know, I want to make sure that there's depth. I want to make sure it looks cool. I want to make sure there's speed lines, there's dust, you know, all that stuff going on. Sound effects, I'm trying to figure out where all that's going to be positioned. And so here, there's also a movement here of the eye where we start from her at the bottom. We go up, the speed lines also help guide us do that. And then we go to the next panel. So here, the way the panels are positioned is also me kind of telling the reader where to look, what to look at first, all of that. So you're thinking about that as well. And you have the same approach when you're putting text balloons together. Right now, they're not talking as much. Everything is very action based, but we'll go into that a little more with the next couple pages. So I didn't like what I drew there. I'm doing an alteration here, making changes, showing more depth. I'm telling, letting myself know it'll probably be best to show more explosion. I'm open to change. I'm open to ignoring that maybe. I'm all, at the same time while putting all this together, I'm also critiquing myself to a degree. So here now she's gonna use her wand and pull the other marionette. What I can do sometimes is if I don't wanna redraw the whole thumbnail, I can just draw a panel and use an arrow to kind of let me know that I'm gonna add it somewhere. I feel like it will be best to kind of slow the pacing down just a little bit to show the character as he's finished doing that action. So I'll put it right after he's touched one of the marionettes. I like to give my pages room to breathe. I like to use most of the page. If there's a lot of action going on, I cut the panels in slants. I have panels extend to the edges. It just feels more chaotic. And in some cases, it just looks more exciting. So here I'm gonna have some characters, as it says, just use some characters kind of to maybe make what's going on clearer, just in case it isn't. And here, these characters will kind of be these characters, these side characters, cloaks, they're not as important. I'll kind of use them to kind of explain to the audience very briefly and creatively what's going on. And I'll probably place those word balloons a little better to have them be easier to read. You want to make sure they're placed in such a way where there's a nice flow to which ones read first, second, third, and all of that. So here I'm going to draw the marionettes actually colliding, draw some explosion. I know it's going to be huge, speed lines, sound effects, all of that dust flying around. I'm thinking about all these particles, all these little tiny things make everything look interesting. Maybe the floor is gonna be collapsing a little bit. I'm thinking about all of that. So here I was thinking, you know, the two marionettes have kind of collided now. Danger is not completely gone, but things can cool down a little bit. And so now I'm having the panels not extend to the edge. I'm having it a little more simplified. I'm having the two characters that just tag team those marionettes having their backs against each other talking and I'm also using this opportunity to explain further what's going on. Probably where I put the text balloons, one character saying one thing, the other saying, saying another thing. I decided maybe that's just too easy. I decided to put another, switch the camera angle up just a little bit. I kind of wanted a visual with an abstract kind of background that kind of helps sell further what he is saying. In these cases, with these close-ups, I don't need to draw backgrounds as much, so I'm just not gonna do it in those cases and probably do something something interesting still, but not necessarily backgrounds. And with the last panel, that's where I wanna show more rebels kind of attacking the cloaks, because like I said, the danger is not completely gone, but at least two marionettes are down. So I'm having the panels a little calmer. Now with this panel, I know I wanna show more rebels attacking. As they're talking, 
I want to show all the damage that's happening from the rebels, from the marionettes, from all of that, all the chaos as they're talking over it. It's almost like they're narrating, but it's really dialogue between two characters. It's also somewhat exposition. And so I just know that that panel over there is just going to be chaos. I don't know exactly how it's going to look, but that's what's in my head as they're still talking to help sell what's going on. And eventually, because he mentions things about a certain place, I decided to draw that place. Again, I'm drawing different things, keeping the panels interesting. Even though these two characters are talking, I'm not just having talking heads the whole time. I'm having their dialogue kind of go all over the place, but I'm showing different aspects of what's going on. And I'm making sure what, what I'm showing and what the characters are saying are connected. It's kind of like if you have two characters in a coffee shop, you have them talking, you show the coffee shop, they're talking, you sh show some headshots, they're talking, uh, you show some close-ups maybe in their eyes or their mouth, they say something interesting. You show just the coffee in a panel, like the panel is just a cup of coffee, you know, steam, heat, whatever, flowing up with your dialogue still going on. Just keep things interesting. So I decided to switch up those last two panels and draw a background, kind of like a destination based off of what's going on with the dialogue to let the readers know where certain characters are going and those characters are what the two characters here are referring to. And then the chaos, I'm gonna switch it up to make it look more dynamic. It's behind some kind of pillar. So I want to have the characters kind of talking where the camera is kind of with them. And then you can see like a tiny shot of Obi in the background listening, which is really cool, right? Because so far it's just been characters that we don't really care about, but now it's been revealed with this page flip on page nine. Once you flip the page, you realize, oh, someone's listening and it's one of our characters. I wanted a panel of him being sneaky. I wanted a panel that was a bigger, clearer visual to identify who the character is, Obi in this case. And then I wanted panels kind of leading to the next page. You know, I wanted them to flip the page and be like, Obi, you know what I mean? So the characters at the bottom are kind of just talking, Obi at the background, kind of hiding behind a pillar. I'm figuring out if I want the panel to actually extend to the edge or not. It's still kind of calm, so they don't need to, but it's also still kind of chaotic, so you could. As he's running, that's what I wanted him to deliver the dialogue. I just feel like it has more impact that way. Certain action is going on as he's running away. He kind of says it, you know, he's trying to find a way to get on the ship. And sometimes I add little panels there that I know are gonna be read quickly again because they're very small panels but it kind of helps with the pacing a little bit. If I think things are moving maybe a little too fast, you add panels to kind of slow things down and how slow you want them to be depending on the size of the panel. And also depending on the size of the page, like how much room is left for a panel. One thing I keep in mind when I'm putting my pages together, I don't like my pages to have more than six panels, right? But I'm always willing to break the rules here just real quick. That's kind of like a, very unique type of surveillance camera in my world where it's just this weird eyeball slash plant but it's really a surveillance camera and you can see it blinking it's almost like snapping pictures but like i was saying i don't like to have more than six panels on a page usually once once i hit six panels on a page i'm already kind of in caution mode so i try to add less and less panels and if i feel like it's getting too much maybe i need to redraw the whole page or move the panel to the next page. And if it means I extend how many pages I actually need, I will, but uh, usually I try to make it work because sometimes you can eliminate things that you don't need. So I try to stay under under six panels. Sometimes I use one panel, two, three, four. It just, whatever works, whatever I can justify. But once it goes past six, I start to get a little cautious. And I definitely don't like to go past 10. In fact, I don't even like to touch 10, but if I hit 10, that's where I know, I right, something is wrong. Like I can, I can maybe get two panels and find a way to combine them and get the same message across, right? Because you don't want to always have your panels kind of seem like an animation storyboard. Because with the animation storyboard, you're almost drawing each frame. With comics, you're not necessarily drawing animation keyframes. You're just drawing what you need to, making sure it's cool, exciting, engaging. To just push the story forward. You use the panels to capture each major action telling the story, but you don't want to have a panel for each step a character makes. Now there are exceptions to the rule, especially when you take into account art style or you're doing something that you can justify. In some cases these could have been done with half the panel, but no one's complaining because the art's amazing. Hell, even looks better than some of its anime counterparts. 
there are obviously some rare cases where you want to draw keyframes but at that point really you don't necessarily need to but if you can justify the decisions you're making then i guess ultimately it's fine and one punch man had certain scenes in the manga where they were essentially animation keyframes here is not so chaotic with comedy scenes things that are supposed to be maybe a little funny i always try to have you know a little chibi stylized fun looking versions here and there and i always have the panels be very small and side by side where this is the rare occasion where i would like to do something very keyframey just like a quick gag i still try to make sure the panels aren't too big and maybe you can see this is a little bit of a challenge where you can read part of the script maybe you guys can let me know in the comments why you think i made certain decisions based off of what you're seeing in the script and what i'm doing with the panels here i'm kind of going back to this page thinking of more interesting ways i could put things together and so sometimes I would just draw a smaller version of the page and I wouldn't necessarily draw anything in the panels, but I'm just trying to come up with a new way to cut the panel. And then I'll have an arrow kind of letting me know what panel goes where. And you see me cutting the panel. I'm trying to make sure everything doesn't look too weird and I'm trying to make sure it doesn't have too many panels. Luckily so far, I don't think that has been too much of an issue here. I'm tilting his head. Maybe I'm drawing him from a different angle. But I think that might be more interesting. But if it's the same thing, I will just have an arrow from the previous iteration and just point to that spot. See here with the last page, I'm going to add two more panels because again, I feel like everything's moving too quickly. As you can see on the script where it says stuff about like an alarm, I wanted something different that didn't necessarily have our character too much into it. So maybe zooming out out of the building to show that the alarm is beyond just her room. The alarm is for all the dorms. So. I zoom out completely to show all the dorms, maybe even draw some characters at the bottom to show that she's not the only one listening. It just helps sell the vibe. So as the alarm is kind of finishing the notice, I kind of zoom back into the room, showing her looking at the alarm. And after that, you just keep messing with it until you're ready. Here I'm, you know, trying to make sure the reading orientation is pretty easy. The way I make my comics, my manga is left to right reading because I'm published in the US and that's kind of the reading orientation you go for is, is up to you or whoever's in charge, whether it's your publisher or the country you're in. Some people, I see some people try to do right to left as an homage to Japanese comics, but if it's going to be published here in America, then what's the point? I'm coloring in the back. Usually this is done. This is usually this is done for flashbacks and manga, but that's not what I'm doing here. I just want to be able to see the panels clearer. I knew I, I knew all of this had to happen in six pages because anything more than that might have just been dragging on. I think I cut it down to nine because sometimes you can look at two panels and you can join them together where the same goal is still met. So you just keep tweaking until you have exactly what you need before you actually then go into creating the final pages. Just be able to justify your decisions, read that script, try to visualize the characters moving, almost like you're watching the show, where do you think the camera would be? That could be influenced by maybe some of your favorite shows. So that's all folks, I know it was a long video. You were a real one if you watched to the end and hopefully you learned a thing or two. Please don't forget to like the video, work pretty hard on it. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you're interested in the stuff like this, there is more to come, probably shorter videos than this one. I'll definitely make a future video on several shots they can use for your panels, headshots, wide shots, establishing shots, when to maybe use a bird's eye view or an ant's eye view and things like that. Close-ups, maybe close-ups on certain body parts, not necessarily the whole face. Subscribe for those. Like, United States should smash that subscribe button. Turn on all notifications, hit that bell so you stay notified each time I upload absolutely anything. Share with people you feel might be interested in making comics or manga or whatever. If you're interested in my comic, Apple Black, there'll be links to where you can find that, volume one, volume two. Published and serialized on Saturday AM. We have our app, it's free. You can go check out more of our stuff. A starter guide in there to let you know everything about us and how to maneuver the app. Again, latest issues of Saturday AM are free. Fan out Friday are free. And check out all the other cool stuff that are on the app. Got two months of Skillshare. Swipe manga. And I'm out.